Hi, everyone. This is Rob Roy of LA Wave Options, and welcome to Trade Finder Live. For those of you that were with us last week, as you can tell by the background, I'm still in the Appalachian Mountains. It wasn't necessarily LA, but Mother Nature uh, intervened with a uh, bit of a blizzard for the past couple of days. And at this point in time, I believe it's 18 degrees uh, Fahrenheit right now. So it's uh, pretty darn cold out there. So lots of ice and snow. So stay extended in the uh, Appalachians. Not a horrible place to, uh, uh, to be snowed into, honestly. If you weren't with us last week, well, I came up here for Thanksgiving holidays and now you know the rest of the story. So um, again, hopefully you had a uh, great Thanksgiving. Uh, as we uh, move into this, a uh, couple of things. First of all, if you're new with us for this Trade Finder, each and every time we do a webinar, we show this uh, disclosure, disclaimer. It's very important that you read through it and uh, take a snapshot of it if you haven't seen it uh, before. Uh, if you have seen it before and, and haven't read through it, please do so. Uh, it's important. Uh, with this, uh, there's a couple of primary things that the powers that be want us to share with you. Number one, we are not registered to give individual investment advice in the United States. And two, because we have a lot of international viewers, a lot of international subscribers, any pricing that we're talking about is assumed to be in U.S. dollars unless noted otherwise. So those are a couple of key things. But again, take a quick uh, snapshot of that. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the market. I did send a note out to our subscribers. We do commentary uh, now each and every week, just like we do this on Tuesday night. On Thursday nights, we do a uh, um, webinar for subscribers only where we go through in depth each and every alert uh, and give them an opportunity to ask direct questions uh, on any of the alerts that we have in either of the portfolios, the impulse or the volatility portfolios. Uh, but in the meantime, if there's things that are found are important, then we'll send out notes and they're alerted to that as well so that they can go to the website and, and see the, uh, the commentary. Uh, I'll show you where that is here in just a second. Uh, but um, this week uh, or today, actually, I, I made a comment uh, because I felt like it was important. We take a look at the market. Now that zigzag pattern is still in place. The same one that we've talked about uh, all the way back to June. And we actually had a viewer write in today and said, which I wasn't aware of, just a coincidental type thing, that um, the high of the Dow back in 1929 was 381 which is that same level we've been talking about for the 100% extension of the zigzag for a long period of time. Now, that's a pretty ominous comparison. Uh, Maybe a coincidental fact. Uh, it, it's uh, interesting if that's all it is, but uh, um, just something, a little tidbit to throw out there. So here's that zigzag pattern. Again, still in place. Looks like we're marching up there. You can see how long we went sideways, two to three weeks. Rob, sorry to interrupt. We can't see your chart. We can just see the disclaimer okay. still. Sure. Yeah, no, thanks for letting me know. So here's where we are with the uh, the zigzag pattern that started back in June. There's that 381 level. And then what I was talking about here is the uh, couple of weeks that we went, uh, two to three weeks, where we just bounced around. That's 61.8% Fib extension and the uh, most recent highs uh, back in the beginning of September. So all that made a lot of sense. And now we're moving back to the upside. Now, looking at intraday, uh, it's pretty interesting to see what has been occurring uh, over the past two days. Yesterday we opened, the futures were up, and then uh, the market opened. And when it opened, <clears throat> there was a big sell program that hit immediately. I mean, the market went straight down. And that's the last trading day of the month, right? Yesterday was November 30th, so last trading day of the month. And I've talked about this before when we've had those recordings on the S&P and the melt-up scenario on how this time of the year volume drops off, volatility can tend to drop off as well. And you kind of just get this slow um, drift, if you will, to the upside uh, throughout the uh, month of December and the holidays uh, between Thanksgiving and end of the year, basically is uh, normally when this occurs. There was one year where we had a big sell-off on Christmas Eve. So yes, yeah, you know, nothing in the world of trading is 100%. General terms, that's what happens. But this year, and it ties in with how institutions work, uh, a lot of them will take the month of December off if they've had a good year. If they've had a good year, then they can sell at the end of November, 
They've got their year. They have their targeted target um, uh, performance to get their bonuses. And if they've achieved that, then um, they may just wrap things up, just close up the end of November and say, hey, we hit our benchmarks. We get our bonuses at the end of the year. We don't want to risk anything with December. And they just go away. And so that's likely what was going on yesterday. We had the big spike down and then kind of just – tried to drift back to the upside throughout the day. And that was yesterday's trade, which also tapped the 10 day moving average on the low, which was interesting. Well, today was kind of the exact opposite. Well, today we have the first trading day of the month and that's when institutions put new money to work. Those that are putting uh, money into the market through dollar cost averaging, um, IRAs, 401ks, those types of things. Uh, as they're uh, putting money away month after month after month, um, the first trading day of the month is when the institutions put that money to work. And remember, by prospectus, they're only allowed to keep a small amount in cash. Uh, that money has to go into the market. So even if they may not be comfortable with where the market is, they got to put it somewhere. And so that's the first trading day of the month. So we had the big uh, high open. And that was sold into a couple times uh, throughout the course of the day. You can see we actually gapped up a little bit there on the open and closed uh, uh, still up nicely for the day and a two-day uh, positive net, if you will, between the two days. But just exact opposites of what was going on. But it really ties into what we've been talking about as far as this melt up, how institutions work, all those little intricate things that go on behind the scenes in the world of trading. So now the last piece of the puzzle is – if the guys that have done well and they've already achieved their bonuses, if they're ready to pack it in, the other guys that haven't, and there's a lot this year that haven't. A lot of people uh, stayed too long to the short side, missed the uh, turn uh, in March, and a lot of people didn't believe uh, the move to the upside um, as we moved higher, even those that, uh, that may have gotten out to the downside or just sat that out. They were late getting to the party on the uh, move to the upside. Uh, there's a lot of institutions that have not achieved the benchmark of the SPY uh, at this point in time yet. And so they're going to be chasing performance. You may hear that terminology on the financial networks. They'll be chasing performance through the end of the year because they haven't hit their benchmarks. They haven't gotten their bonuses. That's where the big money comes from the investment advisors. Their salaries aren't that great. The big money is from the bonuses that they get paid. So um and well, their salary is not that great. That's all relative, isn't it? I mean, it's everybody's opinion as to what's a great salary or not. But the really big money comes from bonuses. So you have those kind of two dichotomy things. And now that we're out of November, then that's gone. Uh, you may see a few people, uh, when you get a big move to the upside, there may be some quick uh, retracements as, uh, as some sell into that and take that opportunity. But I think that scenario is going to play out through the rest of the year. So I felt like that was worthwhile information. So if you wondered, well, I thought this was supposed to be a low volatility time. And then to see that in a big moves to the downside uh, intraday. Well, those are just individual institutions. And because the volume is low, it can exaggerate what the move looks like when it's really not that big of a move. It's just, it appears that way because volume's low. So uh, that's about it with the SPY. Still looking like we're marching up to that area. If we want to take a look at the DMI, it looked like last week, like we might be getting ready to turn up. You can see down here, it, we didn't. It just kind of looked at it. And that's when I was talking about how uh, you, you can have separation between the two directional indicators where that part's good. I mean, there was confirmation today um, of that upward move. And the ADX is trying again to move back to the upside, but I've mentioned that you can have a scenario where it looks like the ADX is going to break up, break through 20, break above the negative directional indicator, get between the two, and it just doesn't. You, you got to wait for it to actually do that. And uh, it's just amazing how often this kind of a scenario happens where it, it looks like it's going, you're like, ah, oh, it's definitely going to do it. Let's just go ahead and get in. And then it just move the other way. It just doesn't happen. So uh, let the triggers actually happen, I guess, is the point that I'm trying to make through through this. So uh, that's uh, about as much as we can talk about with the SPY, but there is something else that I wanted to show you. I've mentioned numerous times where all the things that we teach, LA Wave, uh, the technical signals that we use, uh, any of those can be used in any security in any time frame. And talking about the volatility 
uh, portfolio um, where we do our triangle or triangles and our um, unique um, proprietary, whatever word you want to use, strangles that we use around the triangles. There was a really good triangle on the three minute chart of the E mini futures today, the SP futures. And I said that you, you can take this and break it down. You know, Elliot always talked about degrees. You can break this down as, as small as you want. Uh, and so here's a three minute chart. This is what I watch every day. You've probably heard me say that before as well. And look at how nicely formed that symmetrical triangle was. So this is intraday. And then we got the breakout to the upside. Really nice breakout to the upside from the triangle. And then we came back down. Now, normally, the retracement of the breakout goes back to the point, the origin of the breakout, so the point of the triangle. It went a little bit further today, uh, but I just thought that was something worth showing you, uh, an exact um, depiction, if you will, of what I've been saying is that we look at daily charts here, but you can break it down as to uh, whatever time frame you want. And uh, the patterns are still the same. It doesn't matter what the security is. It doesn't matter what the time frame is. The patterns are still the same. But uh, I thought you might find that interesting as to what occurred uh, intraday today. So uh, I, I guess I should have asked, was, was everybody able to see that chart? Were, were we able to see that chart? Yes, we were. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, so now we're back. Uh, now, the next thing I wanted to show you was uh, we did close out a, uh, a trade uh, from last week. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that. It was on Sony. Can we see this one? Yeah, it's taking just a little bit of time to convert. There, we've got it now. Okay, I'll, I'll remember that. And uh, It seems like when you change applications from web browser to profit source, etc., it takes a bit of time. But once you're into the application, it's reasonable. Got it. Okay, sounds good. So this was on Sony, and you can see that uh, it was a little over two months in this trade. And looking at the mark-to-market uh, -market graph, it spent a good deal of time in the negative column, not super significantly, but uh, not unusual for uh, putting on debit trades. We've talked about this, and we try to educate our subscribers on this, that uh, when you're putting on fixed risk debit-based trades, until you get the move that you're looking for, it's not unusual to see the position move into a loss. It's nothing to worry about. So that's basically by design how the options work. Uh, so we ended up with almost a 50% gain. And here was the entry that was sent out on September 22nd. And you can see that here's the chart. It was a descending triangle, a couple of other notes. Uh, it completed uh, the zigzag. So there was a zigzag preceding the triangle. So here we had a directional zigzag and then a corrective triangle, corrective descending triangle following the completion of the zigzag. That's a pretty good Elliott wave setup where we have back-to-back -back Elliott wave corrective patterns. Uh, technically a zigzag is a corrective pattern, even though in this case it's to the upside. And I know uh, there's always the vernacular of correction being viewed as a downward move, not necessarily. So there was the zigzag Nice uh, descending triangle following it. Really good setup for one of our strangles. And so we had the December uh, 90 call, 70 put on Sony. Uh, not one of the most volatile stocks in the world. Uh, it was an ADR, so it uh, doesn't do a whole lot intraday here. A lot of it gets a signal from what happens overnight. Uh, but you can see here, uh, it says adjustment which means that we're not totally out. And the reason that we're not totally out is we still have the whole month of December left to go. But the stock got overbought. There's that separation, say it with me, no security in any time frame gets very far away from the 10 day moving average. So we're, we're getting overbought. And the call, remember, was the 90 strike call. So it was well in the money. It was almost five points in the money, which means that now it being a front month contract, if it did come back to that 10 day moving average and you can see the little ascending triangle that was forming there with those multiple highs there around 90 and then the higher lows. So we had a little ascending triangle. If this indeed came back from that breakout back down to test 90 again, 
the fact that the 90 call is in the money, then that profit is going to disappear. And you start to think, well, we're going to run out of time because if it comes back to 90, now 90 is the at the money strike. It's not in the money anymore. And so whatever time decay um, is occurring speeds up. And it just long winded point is from a risk to reward standpoint, take the profit, lock the profit in, don't risk the stock pulling back to the 10 day moving average. And then you're running out of time before it turns around and goes back to the upside for the uh, uh, eventual climb to. And I, I still believe that there's a good likelihood that the stock goes to 100. You've heard me talk about this, you know, tractor beam, this Star Trek analogy of when stocks get this close to 100 is just, they just seem to get drawn right to that. There's nothing magical about that number. It's just a round number. It just happens over and over and over again. And so I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Sony get there, but when? You know, does it correct back first and take a little while? And then we run out of time before December expiration occurs, but and then it turns and moves back. Well, that's too late for us at that point in time. So the reason that uh, it still says adjusted is we just took the call off. So we still own that put. Now, if the stock were to turn around significantly and head back down, or if the market were to just fall apart. And I think there's a lot of nervousness in the market right now. There's a lot of complacency in some areas, but there's a lot of people that are, ah, you know, this is just, it's going too far, too fast kind of a thing. We need to pull back. All, all that kind of stuff is still out there as well. So it just, you trade what the charts show you until they change. That's basically the answer to that when you have the conflicting opinions. Uh, but at this point in time, if something bad happened, there's a chance within a month's time that the uh, the put option can re regain some value. If it doesn't, if it expires worthless, that's no worries either. Again, the worst we can do is finish with just under a 50% profit in the position. So I thought that, thought that one would be interesting to show you since uh, it, it had a few different variables in there with the, the call being well in the money, getting them to overbought, starting to get in the front month time frame, but not taking the entire position off. The put was almost worthless anyway, so why not just hold it as a bit of a lottery ticket in case something happens? And if it regains any value, then that's just extra profit that's added to the alert. So I wanted to share that with you. And I also wanted to show you where the uh, uh, commentary is um, that I mentioned to you from sending out notes to our subscribers and you know, I get long-winded talking. Well, I get long-winded typing sometimes too. So the market update was two parts today. So that's where we have written communication with the subscribers in addition to sending emails, et cetera. But in addition to our Thursday night uh, insiders meeting for subscribers only, we can communicate uh, intra-week, if you will, uh, through uh, these means. And if they have a question, then they can send me an email on it. So uh, lots of different ways we try to uh, stay in touch uh, with the, our uh, subscribers. All right, so now let's take a look at last week we selected TJX was our case study consideration. There's a couple more that we talked about, so I'm going to go through those as well. But here's TJX. Not really much of a change from last week. If we go back and walk it back to the 24th. So there's the 24th where we were just starting to break out. And so the high was or the close. Let's just go with the close was 64.33. And then we go forward today. The close was 64.88. So it's up 50 cents uh, since last week. Uh, still looks good from the wave three standpoint. Taking a look down here at the DMI though. Yeah, the positive directional indicator moved to the upside. The ADX is moving up. However, when you look at the scale, hasn't made it to 40 yet. So even though it's looking like, wow, the ADX is getting awfully close to that positive directional indicator, meaning that when the ADX moves outside the positive directional indicator, that's usually an early sign that, hey, you know, we're, we're starting to run out of steam here. Uh, doesn't mean that the uh, upward move is over. It's not the end of it necessarily. It just means we're kind of running out of gas here. And you might want to tighten up stops if you're trading stock or um, look to take some profits if you've got a nice, you know, profitable options position, something along those lines. Even though it may not be the end of the move, 
You know, we, we don't try to get in at the exact bottom and out at the exact tops. If you try to do that, you'll be an awfully frustrated trader because it's almost impossible to do. So uh, just don't see anything uh, that changes the picture that we looked at last week. It still looks good. It's a stock that's, you know, this is their time of year, uh, the holiday season. So from a fundamental standpoint, that makes sense if you like fundamentals. So we have technicals and fundamentals saying that stay the course with uh, – TJX. I did want to share with you, we talked about OZK that we had added as an alert uh, to our subscribers. Um, the financial sector and the energy sector is doing very well uh, at this point in time. Both of them corrected. Well, in fact, let's just take a look at them real quick and I'll show you the corrections that occurred. So here's XLF. Here is the financial sector. Well, you can see yesterday, everything basically took a hit. Yesterday, little tiny triangle. Look at that little tiny triangle there. We mentioned this last week, but we just completed our course for our subscribers on triangles. And Elliot talked about a lot of triangles are small. We tend to focus on the larger ones. A nice one like we showed you on the three-minute chart in the, uh, uh, the E-mini futures. But a lot of triangles go unnoticed because they're rather small. But look, still a triangle and still a thrust type of a breakout. So they're everywhere. Hopefully you're starting to identify things like that yourself. And so now right back to test that area today. So just a one day drop in the XLF and then right back to the upside. And then let's look at the XLE as well. So now we have the uh, energy sector. Also, you can see took a hit yesterday, but stabilizing today. Look at the 10 day moving average, hovering above the 10 day moving average. Let's throw that on the XLF chart as well. And you can see this actually a little bit higher. So if we had to look at the two, both those sectors are doing well. The XLF maybe slightly outperforming, uh, slightly better looking charts, but both of them uh, looking pretty good. And both of them coming back off overbought conditions. They both got overbought. They've both corrected those and rectified them. Now we'll see how things go from, from now till the end of the year. Well, OZK is obviously a financial and it held in there pretty well. So it went down yesterday uh, with the uh, sector and bounced back a little bit today, uh, but it still looks really good. The DMI, here's what I was talking about as far as when the ADX moves outside the positive directional indicator. That was what we were just talking about back over here with TJX. The fact that it, was getting close to doing that. Well, it actually has done that in OZK. So from a fundamental or from a technical or purely technical standpoint here, um, we want to see the positive directional indicator turn back around. The ADX is kind of uh, dipped down a little bit with this consolidation over the past couple of weeks. The first signal would be the positive directional indicator. It's more responsive than the ADX is. The ADX tends to lag a little bit, as we've mentioned uh, several times. And again, if you want to learn more about these technical indicators, go to our website. We have the trade scan series where we go through each of our confirming indicators, did a whole webinar session on each and every one. So there's a lot of information there uh, to go through um, to understand how all of these indicators work. And that's helpful. So every time I show it to you, I don't feel the need to go through and explain the ins and outs of the indicator each time. But uh, so the ADX dropping down, we want to see that positive directional indicator rebound. If the stock turns back to the upside, it should do that. There's still room between here and 40, but we want to see some of that pretty soon. We're at an area of support, as you can see right through here. So staying above that, 28 level, 27 is uh, important, but so far it has. Consolidating on top of a support resistance level, never a bad thing. Quite often you'll sit there for a while and then it'll take off again, kind of that blast off type effect uh, that I've mentioned in the past. So let's see how that uh, goes over the next few trading days. And by the time we talk again next week, we'll have a much better indication if that level held and we've, uh, headed back to the upside or not. Now we had um, a comment from uh, the internet where someone asked, would you look at the metals? 
So I said I would in this trade finder. So let's take a quick look at the charts of GLD and SLV. So the gold and silver ETFs, if you will, we had this huge descending triangle in GLD in gold. And then you can see a pretty clear breakout to the downside until today. Today we jump back to the upside. Now we do have a strangle on this for our subscribers. Now you, you could look at this and say, well, we need to take the puts off because the stock's turning around and going back to the upside. Maybe it is, but it's just a little too quick to do that because let's put that 10 day moving average back on there. And now you can see, oh, it, it makes more sense now, doesn't it? So we had gotten a little bit overextended to the downside and it can just walk you back and you can see uh, if we walk the chart back to yesterday, there you can see that we're a little oversold here and a doji yesterday. So all that adds up to, all right, let's go back and test that 10 day moving average and close that oversold gap. Now, if we get follow through and jump back over top of the 10 day moving average tomorrow, that could be a different scenario. Then maybe we do look at taking the puts off. There'll be a gain in the puts and then let the calls run if we are gonna turn and head back to the upside. But I just wanted to share with you, you gotta look at all these things and don't just assume that one day changes everything. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but at this point in time, all it did was overcorrect or correct an oversold condition. Now taking a look at SLV, this one's different. SLV never really broke down to the same degree that GLD did. You can see the clear cut breakout, just boom. Five straight days to the downside out of GLD. Silver didn't do that. Silver just came down and got into this area right through there of support. And we talked about this a long time ago because we had this symmetrical triangle here as an alert for our subscribers. Again, in the volatility portfolio, which uh, I, I know I've mentioned that a couple of times. I, I think I should take a moment here to say that that's something we're going to be looking at for our subscribers really hard throughout the month of December. We feel that the signals are there that January is going to be far more volatile than November and December is. We're going to be entering a period of greater volatility, we believe. And so we'll be maybe just a little bit lighter on the directional stuff in the impulse portfolio and starting to put, we got lots of room. We don't have a whole lot of strangles on right now in the volatility portfolio. So we'll start looking to add as we find really good ones, uh, new uh, strangles to get ready for that uh, expected volatility uh, to arrive in January. Now that doesn't mean that the market's gonna fall apart. Just think that we're due for a period of increased volatility. If we do hit that 381 level and do for some sort of a correction from there as well. It's just prudent to prepare. If you go through a period where you have low volatility and you're expecting increased volatility and you have a strategy that's designed to take advantage of that, then it just would be dumb not to. So that's just some general things I thought I would share with you that, uh, that we're going to be looking to do for our subscribers throughout uh, the rest of December, the rest of the year, basically. But look how SLV rebounded back so nicely to the upside off of that area of support. It's almost all the way back to this bit of a channel that it's formed, bouncing back and forth between 21 and 23. Uh, it's well on its way back up to 23 already, just in one day. So it's interesting that they used to just move in lockstep. I've covered this in the past as well, but uh, it used to be that whatever gold did, silver followed. Now it almost seems the other way around. It seems almost as silver's leading gold. I know the gold bugs will they'll say, no, 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 you're, well, you're way off base there. They won't agree with that scenario at all. It just, that's the way it seems to appear is that silver is taking definitely a more prominent role. A lot of people think that's because that silver has a play in the actual market now, as far as being part of uh, electronics components, things like that, uh, that that's given it a little bit more of a uh, uh, place, if you will, at the, the big table with, uh, with big bad gold.
So uh, and I was asked to show that, so I wanted to uh, go through and, uh, and show that as well. Oh, uh, one thing as the we've been looking at, which comes up a lot, it's one of the uh, big momentum stocks, NEO. Uh, I wanted to show you that where <coughs> if you were looking for some sort of an opening, there's a pullback. Now, last week when we looked at this, it's just really hard going back to where we were last week. So let's go back to the 24th. So there's last week. To look at this DMI and see where that ADX is, remember I was saying that I just don't see many of them that get that high? It's just really rare to see an ADX get that high. I talked about this just last week. Uh, so when um, you see that and you're thinking, well, this stock just seems to go up all the time, but you have to trust your indicators. You just, you have to trust them. And then now here's where we are a week later, right? So we did have a little bit of an upward move and then back down. Actually, did we? No, actually we've been nothing but down since last week. And there's the ADX uh, starting to bend back down, come back to earth. I don't think Neo's done. That's just a personal opinion. I don't think the run's over. It just got overbought and needed to rest. And the DMI was showing clearing signals that overbought, you know, just red flashing lights, yellow flashing lights, whatever you want to say. Beware, beware. The stock's overbought currently. Um, you probably get a better time to get in. Well, it dropped $5 today. So that's a 10% plus move to the downside today. So I think that uh, there's going to be some some better entries. Maybe we come down and hit this wave four target uh, all the way back into the low 30s. Uh, be awfully interesting if it made it down that far. It's still in a wave three, still don't have the wave four labeled. <coughs> so it's not currently in a wave four, uh, but that's possible if it uh, continues down. Now getting an ADX that strong, just talking about, uh, you know, the market doesn't, Things just don't always just don't fall apart after a big strong move like that. It just got overbought. It just got ahead of itself. And for the ADX to get that strong, it needs to rest. It needs the stock needs to correct. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole move is over. We're coming back down to 20. That was it. It was just a short term thing. And and that's the end of uh, Neo as a uh, uh, a momentum stock. I'm not saying that at all. Just saying it was it was tired. And it uh, run a long way and it and needed a rest. I thought we'd look at the other one because y'all are probably going to ask about these anyway. Um, they usually come up, so just get them out of the way. Uh, PLTR, uh, very similar scenario here where it had that big run. Now, just not as much data here to talk about. So this one's a little bit uh, trickier from the technical standpoint. But with the little information that we have, you can see the ADX got way up above 60 again. You can't put as much weight in that as you do in NEO with so much more history, but still it's enough to pay attention to. And it also has come back a bit uh, from big lofty levels. This one only fell six and six and a half percent, which, you know, it sounds funny, only fell six and a half percent. But it does show where I know a lot of people like to play these momentum stocks and it's a lot of fun when you get it right and you can make money in a very short period of time. But if you don't have some sort of a system, if you're just following along with, you know, whatever's hot at the time, you don't have a, a set of technical indicators that you trust, that money can go just as fast as it came and sometimes more goes than came. And that, that scenario plays out over and over and over again as well. So I did want to share with you you know, following your indicators, trust your indicators. And if it's a stock you really like, if it's a stock you want want to trade, or if you want to hold it for a long term, um, you can quite often get better entries by trusting your indicators. All right, so now let's go ahead and uh, see what we can find for uh, this week. And come down here to our pre-computed scans. For those of you that may be new with us, this is a program called Profit Source. 
Uh, a lot of people really like the charts. They get comments about the charts all the time. And so you can go to privatesource.com if you'd like to find out more information about the software. They're making some really cool changes uh, to it coming up. Enhancements, not changes, but enhancements. Uh, some neat additions to it. One of them over here, you can see right now, there's the LA Wave option. So if you happen to be an LA Wave option subscriber and you own the software, uh, the search is there where it says EWO, EWO Consolidating Bullish and uh, and bear, those are uh, our bullish corrective and bullish impulse. Those are basically my indicators that they've put there to where you can use them as a subscriber. And you can look at the charts every day, same charts that I'm looking at. And I, I think that's a good educational exercise for our subscribers because then they can ask a question. Well, this stock was in the search, but you didn't send it out as an alert. Why not? Well, this is the start part, right? This is the confirming indicators. Then we apply Elliott Wave. So I get the, the stocks from these searches. Then Elliott Wave is applied to see if this is indeed something we want to send out as an alert. And I, I talked about this last week, so I, sorry about repeating myself, but I know we have new people every week. So those of you that are with us, just bear with me as I get repetitive. But I really like trading directional trades in the Wave 3. It's my favorite wave to trade. I know a lot of people say stay away from it. I think that's a mistake. It is difficult to figure out where a wave three is going to end unless you have a zigzag. If there's a zigzag in the wave three, which shows up a lot, well, now you have uh, a bit of a target on where the wave three could end. And sometimes you get really quick moves in the wave three because it's such a strong move. And because it's such a strong move, it, it usually doesn't give you really bad you know, pullbacks if, if something were to change. So taking a look at today, you can see that under the bullish impulse stocks, there's 15. That shows you what's happening in the market, doesn't it? That shows you that drift up uh, because that's more than we had last week. I also wanted to share with you this. We'll probably, may <coughs> probably maybe, I hate when people do that. We will likely uh, look at the consolidating signal next week as we start to prepare as we are with our subscribers for a more volatile January, expected anyway. And they've, they've moved up as well. And there was 78, now there's 83. But for today, let's stay uh, with the impulse. There's 15 of them there, but now you can come over here and with these new additions, and there's some more cool stuff that's coming. This is just the start of it. You can also check the wave three. So now what it's looking for is, are there any stocks that have uh, reacted to the confirming indicators that it looked for, meaning that they're moving to the upside? And then we can add in, are they in a wave three? So it just focuses, are they in an LA wave three? So you're not looking for wave five or anything else or corrective patterns. We can look and see if there's a zigzag within the wave three. And now we've narrowed it down to what's there, five? So instead of 15, or there's what, 200, 700 stocks in the, uh, that are in wave threes, that sounds like a pretty bullish signal. Uh, but now you can narrow it down to five really good ones to look at. Doesn't mean they're all trades, but to look at. So let's let's do that. Uh, Nike's back on the list. Uh, we had Nike. Look, TJX is still there. So that's good from last week. So the fact that it's still showing up on the signals is that's a really good sign. All right, let's look at uh, CME. And so this is the uh, exchange. And you know, there, there's a lot of people that, that like to look at these from a bit more of a defensive standpoint when they start to get a little concerned about where the market could go because whether or not the market's moving up or down as long as people are trading the exchange is making money right so they don't really care whether the market's going up or down as long as people are executing trades so whether it's long or short doesn't make any difference to them whatsoever so we can see here is the chart and before we dropped in March it had gotten up to 230, and then we uh, we had a bounce back, ran into a lot of resistance there at 190, and that's held ever since. And it looks like it wants to make another run at that 190 level now, with the middle of the wave five right smack at 190. 
So when you add these extra little ancillary things in there, in other words, more than the DMI, more than the CCI, money flow, all the little things that I look at that are in the system, in addition to Elliott Wave, if you have the Elliott Wave, Wave 5 target at the same spot that's been resistance for six months, that's just another little thing of, well, all we have to do is run up and test resistance. We don't have to break to new highs. We don't have to be off and running into never, never land or anything along those lines. This is just a move up to resistance is all we're looking for. So that just kind of is a one more thing to up the percentages in your favor of potentially putting on an alert. And obviously CME is, is um, liquid. And with uh, the DMI, Having the ADX cross above 25, good separation between the two directional indicators. The only negative, if there was one, is it's not a huge move. Stocks trading just under 180 and the target's 190. 10 point move. It's only about 5% move out of the stock. So from that standpoint, uh, maybe a little bit better than that, but somewhere in that area, maybe we look to find something else, but I'm gonna make a note of it because it's a good enough setup that something that um, we could potentially uh, do. So we'll, we'll write that one down and we'll go back and take a look at the rest of them see if we find something that's better. Obviously we don't need to look at TJX, we already have that one. Let's take a look at Nike. We had a bullish position on there, it took a while. It finally got to where it was supposed to. Um, it's one of our uh, out of the money butterflies. There's the wave three. Let's take a look at the DMI. Retail stock, obviously, and um, in the right sector for this time of year. A lot of uh, commentary on the financial networks recently about how well Nike is executing in this environment where some of the other sports apparel companies are really struggling. Lulu is not one of them. Lulu's been doing really well. Uh, so it's been kind of Lulu and Nike have been carrying the ball through the athletic stuff, even though pun intended, or pun intended, I don't know. But uh, as we uh, move towards the um, peak retail shopping time of the year, been a lot of chatter about um, Nike's just clicking on all cylinders when so many other com companies are, are really struggling. So there's your... A support area. If you wanted to do something with this, then you would want to use 130 as a stop if you're trading stock or um, something to consider an adjustment or maybe even exiting a trade if you're trading options or something. But 130, if it breaks that level, then it, it changes the whole game. Uh, not a bad looking DMI, so something that we can uh, um, be okay with. So that's Nike. If you write that one down too. Now, target price on Nike. Let's go back and look because we're in a wave three and see if we can identify the zigzag pattern here to give us target. You can see that bar there is clearly the start of an impulse move. So we move to the upside there and then you could draw your at the top of it here, but we tested it again here or even here. So any of those spots, it really doesn't matter because they're all the same price level. And you get a 36% corrective move. So call it the Fibonacci 38.2% level. <coughs> and now uh, it's only uh, you know five points away from that level. And you know, the, the DMI looks okay. If we're gonna break the 61.8% level and have an extended C wave to 100%, I would wanna see the little more separation between those two directional indicators, which could happen in the next couple of trading days if it moves to the upside. So feel pretty good about the move, the five point move. Uh, as far as continuing up, that I think we still have to wait and see what the DMI looks like once that level is reached. But certainly, uh, worth consideration, if nothing else. So we'll skip that, IDEX Labs, and then T-Mobile.
Now, here's an instance where IDEX got a little bit overbought as well uh, based on the DMI. So here's that same theme. It's interesting how that's worked out to where there's been examples of what I was talking about earlier, but the ADX uh, getting above the positive directional indicator telling you that you know the strongest part of the move is over when we get a big one day correction and then just dead sideways, <coughs> pardon me, from there. So uh, we'll see if we uh, can turn and make a run to the upside. I think this one is a watch list type of scenario. Yes, technically the ADX is turning up. There's separation between the two directional indicators, but we need more. If this is going to make a run at taking out that recent high where the wave three lies at, uh, what was the high of the day here? 485 we're going to need a little more work out of the uh, the DMI. So that one, I don't think we consider as much. I think that just goes on to watch list, see what that plays out over the next couple of days. And that's this is how I trade every day. Look at the results, apply the technicals, apply Elliott Wave, um, see if you can find a reason not to put a trade on. And if you can't, then you put a trade on. But there's some that, well, you know, it doesn't look bad. It's just not there yet. Well, let's keep an eye on that. And see, my watch list has lots of stocks to look at each day in addition to the ones that show up on the uh, on the searches to see if, uh, if some, you know, may fall in line. All right, last but not least. Well, we got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> coming to visit now is that not a cool looking cat cat looks like a lynx so let's take uh now that's a pretty good looking dmi and a wave three that that looks really good as well it's come out of a long so these these two are both really interesting when you have good support areas that aren't that far away. So it limits the risk. You know, if it comes down and it breaks 120, then you're either out if you're trading stock, maybe out if you're trading options or adjusting if you're trading options. For us, the way we make that decision is what are the indicators telling us? If the stock turns around and it breaks the support resistance line, what are the indicators saying? Do we stay the course? Is it temporary? Are they still giving us the signal it's going to go up or are the indicators saying there's been a climate change, something is different and we need to adjust accordingly. So we trust our indicators and that's what you need to do when, when you're, you're trading technically is you, you trust your indicators because if you're just guessing all the time, uh, you, you won't last very long uh, in, in the world of trading. So looking at the DMI, you can see that uh, ADX is curling up, positive directional indicators up. That one looks actually really good. and Wave three, so where are we going from here? I don't really see a discernible zigzag. So I think we would have to say that this bar right here, well, is that a little small in there? Was that enough of a corrective move? Because this is clearly an impulse day, right? So we blasted off of an area of resistance at 120. So you couldn't hold it back here. It tried back on the 13th of October and it couldn't hold it. Remember that you got to have that second day follow through confirmation day. That's exactly why you have to. And so and we didn't get it here either, but it came back down. And now we had to follow through day and it took off. So this could be just an A impulse, which makes it a little trickier. But let's see if this is enough of a correction to qualify as a zigzag. Well, it does. It easily does. So we're right at the 61.8% extension based on that DMI, I think 100% extension is uh, is well warranted here. So it looks like uh, from 133 up to 140 on, uh, on T-Mobile. So uh, there's actually three of them. Any of those three could be our, our choice this week, CME, Nike, or uh, T-Mobile. And uh, Based on, on that chart, you know, you, you have the fundamental standpoint on Chicago Mark CME of 
it doesn't matter what the market's doing. As long as people are trading, the exchange makes money. Then you could look at Nike and say, well, um, we don't know that there's that much of a move yet. You know, if we can break above here, then it becomes more interesting. I think if it breaks above the 61.8% level, there's still a trade there. I don't know that we necessarily need to jump in right now on that one. So this is just what I would be thinking through the process of elimination. Uh, I would say that our selection for this week would be T-Mobile, would be the one to, to look for. So let's make that our official case study for this week. And as I mentioned, as we uh, move into next week, we're going to start looking more on consolidation patterns and start setting up positions, getting ready for for January. And, you know, if, if January doesn't end up being volatile, we'll still have directional trades. It's not like we're going to abandon directional trades and we're not going to do anything in the impulse strategy. It's just we're beefing up the volatility strategy. So I want to make sure that I'm really clear on that. It's not like we're walking away from directional trades. If we find really good directional trades, we're going to put them on. But we are also going to beef up the volatility portfolio and have more positions there in case the volatility does pick up. It's just it's a smart, prudent thing to do. All right, so we got five or ten minutes. Um, happy to take questions, look at charts, whatever you want to do for the last few minutes that we have before we wrap up. Hi, Rob. Yeah, we've got, uh, well, quite frankly, a lot of uh, questions. Um, there's probably 20, 20 something symbols that people have asked you to look at. So um, if we want to uh, work through these reasonably quickly, I can and keep letting you know. Uh, okay. The first one was just uh, Pancash has asked if you wouldn't mind to look back at XLF and XLE quickly and just put the Elliott wave count from the software on. So there's XLF, which is, I should have done that before when I looked at them, but um, there's the XLF, which is still in the wave three. And then the XLE, remember that one from last week, still doesn't have a five wave LA wave pattern. Remember, just because it's not labeled doesn't mean it's not in an LA wave pattern. It means it's not in a five wave pattern because I turn off the um, automatic labeling <coughs> to utilize these tools over here. Uh, and to do it manually. You don't have to. I just like doing it that way, drawing the zigzags and the triangles, et cetera, um, on my own. And then this zigzag tool can also be used for drawing flat. So uh, I just prefer to do them manually, but the software can do it automatically if you want. If, if you have those turned on, then you'll see a bunch of ABCs on your charts. But I, just my personal preference, and, and that's all. So uh, not a whole lot has changed on either one of those from an LA Wave standpoint. Thanks, Rob. And Adam asked a question about the XME, uh, and specifically he's saying that it's been ripping the last few days and some traders see it as a leading indicator for gold and was just wondering your thoughts on that. Well, there it is. So let's take a closer look. It has been. The um, common is correct. It's taken off from another one that had lots of consolidation. So if that holds true, then that would be an indication. If we get that follow through day on GLD, then we can take the put off and let the, and let the call run, which would actually be a lot of fun if it worked out uh, that way. Uh, but we're not going to do that unless we get the follow through day. You, you've seen already enough examples of how important that is, but that's a pretty, pretty strong move off of a good area of support resistance. We look at the DMI, that looks about as good as it can look. That is a great looking, so I had good call on this. And uh, of course, if you're dealing with the metals ETF, it should be a precursor for gold and silver. At least people putting money in the ETF think that that's where the metals are going. I don't know what the composition is uh, of the XME as far as if they own physical or they just own futures contracts. Not sure exactly how they trade it. Most of them have some sort of derivative contracts in there. So there's always an element of time decay with those, but uh, there has to be at least an underlying belief in that security that it's built around that it's going to move, even if they don't actually own the physical asset. But uh, that's, that looks great. It looks like it wants to continue. And, um, you know, we're, we're long SLV. We have a strangle on GLD and, uh, if, um, if this holds true, 
Uh, but appreciate that that symbol. That's that's a good looking one. Thanks, Rob. And uh, Paul uh, actually gave us a number of codes, which I think you've covered, but the only one outstanding is uh, Sonos, S-O-N-O. If you could take a look at that, it'd be great. I figured I covered some of the questions with Neo and Plantier. So, um, well, obviously the big gap to the upside there from long period of time in this 17 area, right in through here. So sitting there forever and then moving to new highs. The gaps trouble me, as you know, if you've listened to any of the recordings that I've made, so looking at that but seems like there's a pretty strong case to be made for that well here's another one where the adx is getting a little bit high the adx is outside the positive directional indicator and it's above 40 wouldn't be been this as concerned about it if it was more in the 30 range because the positive directional indicator could turn around which it still could Let's see, we're trading at 22, three more points uh, could happen. I just be careful with that one. And uh, if you're trading the stock, use tight stops. And if you're trading options, use something, something that's fixed risk and uh, be willing to, you know, have that, at, have that amount of money at, at risk. It, it could continue up and hit that wave five target but the strongest part of that move was used up in that big gap to the upside. Thanks, Rob. Um, we've got uh, Kieran who's uh, given us a number of symbols, which uh, a few people have asked for. So I, I might give you a, a couple at a time. The first couple are Amazon and Facebook. Yeah, there's been a lot of chatter about Fang coming back. Um, to carry the torch into the end of the year. And so um, there's Amazon and hopefully right off the bat, you see that triangle. It's awesome. It's a very looking triangle. ADX is getting down there. It's broken down below 12, it's heading towards 11. It's a pretty low ADX. So I don't think it's gonna take much longer before this breaks out. Uh, at least from the looks of that. And uh, the issue is you're dealing with a $3,200 stock. So our proprietary strangles are just out of the question. There's no way. Uh, could look at the, the twin butterflies uh, would be a scenario. And you just basically, if you haven't heard that before, been a lot of chatter about it, but basically you put a butterfly up there you put a butterfly down here and the stock breaks to the upside and gets within the wings of that uh, upper butterfly, then um, it offsets the loss as the, the put one would go to zero and, uh, and vice versa. The, the danger here is it breaks to the downside and it breaks down too fast. You know, the butterflies need time to work because they start off as time decay neutral and then they become time decay friendly over time, but they really need that the time to go through. Um, and, uh, and start to churn away that time premium. So with that, uh, it's a great pattern. I feel really confident it's going to break out. I don't know another way to trade it other than wait. If you don't do the, the twin butterflies, you wait for, well, let's see what the expected move is. You wait for the breakout and just trade the directional move once it's confirmed. Well, man, that is as classic as it gets. Look at that. Turn the Elliott wave on, and it's a symmetrical triangle following the completion of a five wave. Look at this over here. If you don't have any doubt about whether Amazon moves from triangles, there you go. There's another one right there. Broke out, tested it, and took off. Just it's right there. 
That's exactly what it did before. So highly likely it'll do it again. So you finish the wave five, go through a symmetrical triangle. Textbook, textbook, Ellie Wave. Thanks for asking for uh, uh, this to show everybody. The issue again is how do you trade it? So the high here is 3,500. The low is 28, so 700 points times 80%, so 500, 500 point move. So what you're looking for, either direction. So. Rob, John was just asking whether or not you'd consider an iron condor as a potential strategy for this scenario. Um, yeah, I'd want to see what the risk, I'd have to create it and play around with it, but yeah, possibly. You know, it depends on the month, depends on where you place the strikes, et cetera. But yeah, it's a possibility. Okay, thank you. And just um, continuing on with some of uh, Kieran's uh, symbols, there was Facebook and then Apple, uh, Netflix, and Tesla. So Fang and Tesla, basically. Yeah, okay. Basically, <laughs> <it>. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the people listening want to know the same exact stock. So um, that's kind of a triangle. It's not the greatest formation ever, but it's kind of one. Um, see what... LA wave pattern we're in. That's another one. Look at that. I think that most of them look at the same thing. But um, I mean, the, the FANG stocks before were running in the same pattern, so I wouldn't be surprised if they all look like this. But another one with a wave five completion and a symmetrical triangle. It looks really good. So uh, 280, same problem that we have here with the uh, regular strangles and so back into the, the difference between the twin butterflies or the just waiting and trading it directionally once it moves. So the high there was just call it 300 rounded to 300 and low 240 60 points. So 48 point move. So I'll be looking for there, break out of around 48 points. If you're wondering about the 80%, um, usually the triangles, they'll break about the distance of the width of the triangle. So the mouth of the triangle, the widest part, if you will. But the strongest part of the move is in that first 80%. And then the last 20% tends to be a lot less volatile. So premium comes out. You get a breakout, if you get a thrust type of a breakout, implied volatility is injected into the option. But if the move slows down, the volatility comes back out. So you don't really gain anything by holding a position if the stock's broken out 80%, waiting for it to break that last 20 to hit 100% on the breakout move. Sometimes you actually make less by doing that, depending on how volatile the move was uh, on the first 80%. So that's why you hear me, you know, doing 80% of the move instead of what's the entire move. Thanks, so Rob. Netflix. Yeah, Netflix, Apple, and Tesla. So same scenario here, but uh, so wave five completion, but not triangle. So this one went into flats so the expectation would be for that C wave to continue back up into this we're building it as a trading range and quite often, if you are familiar with flat patterns, you can find within a trading range multiple flats. It just helps you to 
you know, set up your positions, et cetera. So it looks like uh, Netflix wants to go higher and it certainly made a move in that direction today. The target there is easy, uh, 560. Now remember flats can have different lengths seaway. So it doesn't guarantee that we're going to go to 560, but uh, that would be a, uh, a good place to look. And here, here's a little bit of a dichotomy too, isn't it? All right. So we're trading at 505 basically is where we close today. Target's 560. It's only 50 points away uh, on a stock like Netflix could get there relatively quickly. And you look at the DMI and it looks fantastic so far, but the ADX hasn't broken above the negative directional indicator yet. It's not even anywhere close to 20 yet. So if you were going to follow your DMI, you have to wait until that ADX continued up, continued above the negative directional indica indicator, continued above 20, and then guess what? By the time you get there, you're probably awfully close to 560 already, which means then it's too late to trade that move and you would just be waiting to see if it was gonna have enough momentum to break above this resistance here at 560 and take off. So that's why I said there, there's the dichotomy, there's the, the difficulty on that one uh, is, you know, which, which do you wanna do? We do have this kind of a, that launch pad effect here that I talk about, the blast off from the launch pad, going sideways, 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 getting ready to uh, uh, break to the upside. Today could be uh, the first ignition, the first engine ignition, if you will. So that's, that one's a little trickier as far as, do you stay true to your indicator? Do you follow the flat? and trade the flat without the indicator confirming it. Let's see what the CCI shows. Well, the CCI could give you a little bit of, remember the CCI, we look at that because it's, it's also where the DMI can be a touch lagging in the ADX, not in the directional indicators, but in the ADX, the CCI is very responsive all the way through. And you have to look at past history and place a lot of importance there because the scale's so different for every stock. You have some upside room there um, with the CCI. You could fall back on that and use that as a, a decision maker to, to go long. Apple. Been looking really hard at this one. Not a wave five completion, but you can see just a really strong impulse move with the triangle. And now we have a breakout day yesterday and a confirmation day today. So with, with what the market did yesterday, with a lot of stocks moving down with the, with the market, this one broke out on a day like that and then had the confirmation today which is no shocker because today was a much better day in the market um, so basically there's a confirmed breakout in apple to the upside and the dmi is starting to set up nicely again it's not there just because it looks good now doesn't mean that it's going to trigger and the signals are going to be there but boy it looks good right now and then we'll see how that trades out but um Money flows turn around. CCI has a little bit of room. That's really nice looking breakout of a, a symmetrical triangle there on uh, on Apple. As far as the move, well, it's eighty percent of the high, one one thirty eight the low. 103, so 30, 35 points, 24, 25, 26 points, somewhere in that area. What you'd be looking for. So a break above that recent high should happen at Apple. All right, Tesla. The 
it did break out of that long triangle, really vertical move. Looked like it was going to come back down to earth a bit yesterday uh, with that move down and then right back to the upside again today. But there was that gorgeous symmetrical triangle on the top of this support area here. Just a great looking pattern setup. The 10 day moving average, be nice to see it come back down there. Get a little bit of a uh, momentum booster from that. The DMI still looks good though. I mean, the ADX is only at 30. Can you imagine that? With that breakout in Tesla, the ADX is only at 30, which means there, there's plenty more room from that standpoint. That Remember that directional indicator could turn around tomorrow. It could turn around in a day. So I look more at where's the position of the ADX, and especially in relation to the two directional indicators. So with that in mind, um, like to see Tesla come back, test that 10 day moving average, then take off. But I don't think Tesla cares what I think or what I would like to see. And charts don't always, you know, do what is nice and clean and perfect. And they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. But um, that's, Strong breakout move, and it looks like more is coming. Thanks, Rob. Um, we've still got a ton of codes, but we're quarter past the hour, so I'll leave it up to you as to whether or not you, you want to continue or uh, maybe pick it up again next week. Uh, well, we've, we've covered the ones that most people want to look at. Throw, throw me a couple more, and then we'll wrap, wrap it up. Pick, pick two more. Uh, there's a couple of people who are interested to look at the cues. And uh, how about MRVL, Marvel? Okay. So the Q's had, let's see. The, well, Elliot would be loving this. He, he likes these and um, Looks like we're setting up a diagonal there in the wave three, which could easily go up and hit that 315 level on the queues. It hasn't, did it yet? It hadn't broken the new highs yet, but did it today? All right, 303. Yeah, it did. It broke the new highs today and closed 303.46. Yeah, so with new closing highs today, so I don't, I don't really see anything stopping that one from going to 315 unless the whole market falls apart. Let's look at that one next week and see if that diagonal completes. And then um, MRVL. That's right. So the wave five right at 68%. Um, so just passing a fib level through there. And <laughs> looking at the DMI, ADX is curling up. That's a great looking DMI. Boy, we don't set up much better than that. The ADX didn't quite break below 20. You know, I like to see that. I'd rather seeing that ADX get below 20, didn't quite make it, but wow, that looks really good. And then uh, another potential diagonal in there as well. Chart looks very similar to the Qs. Wanted to show you this, or this is a great one to finish on because just like what I showed you on the E mini futures chart, so there's your triangle, there's the breakout, then we come back, retrace the breakout. That's triangle 101 right there. That's Elliott Wave, corrective triangles, that's what they do. They don't always come back that fast, but that's what they do. They break out and they come back and they retrace the breakout. Why? I, I don't know, but they do. And um, that's why we like to trade them and we have a whole portfolio strategy devoted to that pattern. So that, that tells you how much uh, faith we put into it. 
thought this was a great class. Um, hope you enjoyed the cat noises in the background. Um, but that's what happens when it's 18 degrees outside. So um, thanks uh, for your attention this week, as always, and look forward to talking to you again next week. Take care, everybody.